welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. For more than three decades, I've been a summer camp director, and I've had the privilege of working with thousands of children, teenagers, young adult counselors, and parents. I really enjoy sharing stories, tips, and ideas to help others who care about young people raise a generation of kind, self-reliant, optimistic kids who become thriving adults. If you're interested in summer camp, parenting, or happiness, you've come to the right place. In this episode, which is episode 58, I am chatting with Jackie Byer. She is the founder of the Authentic Teacher website and podcast. Her mission is to help students learn using culturally relevant lessons. She wants to share best teaching practices and state-of-the-art technology to help parents and teachers provide the best education possible in the 21st century. Enjoy the episode. I'm really excited to welcome on the podcast today, Jackie Byer of the Authentic Teacher Podcast. Welcome, Jackie. Well, thank you for having me, Audrey. I'm so excited to be here. So tell me a little bit about the work you're doing and what Authentic Teacher is all about. Okay, well, that's a good question. And truth be told, it's still a work in progress. So Authentic Teacher started because I walked into a store one day and I saw this parent from the year before and she said, I miss you. I miss your Facebook group. My son missed his pictures this year because he doesn't, his teacher doesn't have a Facebook group and I miss your weekend math challenges. And so by the time I got home, I had the domain name authenticmath.com, which is what I thought it was going to be, but then it's kind of evolving to authentic teacher. And basically um, what I want to do is um, help teachers come up with ways to create lessons that align with the common core, but, um, you know, use authentic examples. Like, so one of the examples she was probably missing, although her son was in second grade. I keep thinking about this one I did in fourth grade last year where like we were studying fractions and equivalent fractions and my students were struggling so hard to learn fractions. And my husband sent me to the grocery or to the hardware store to get him staples. And he's like, all right, I need half inch staples. And I get to the store and do they have half inch staples? No, there's three eighths, there's five sixteenths, there was some other one. And so I posted a picture of me standing in the store getting the staples and I'm like, these are the ones I bought and did I buy the right ones? Do I have to go back to the store? Is he going to be happy? You know, what, what's the equivalent of, you know, a half inch, you know, are these bigger than, because it had to be at least a half inch. And so, you know, things like that, or like pizzas, like I would cut up fractions for pizzas, or it kind of actually started when I was teaching the second grade class, we were home for five snow days, and my kids were really struggling to learn coins, and I didn't want them to learn to, you know, to lose what I had been struggling, and I wanted them to kind of have practice at home. I'm like, well, if you're home, so I kind of like, I have puppets, and then I don't know why, my third grade teacher taught us with puppets, I have puppets, and so I took like these videos of me teaching my puppets how to um, make like 15 cents out of like how many different ways, and I was kind of teaching them how to use academic talk, because that's always the big thing in the classroom, you know, and, you know, so the one puppet made 15 cents out of 15 pennies, and the other one used a dime and a nickel, and just, you know, three nickels, and just all these different ways, so I'm kind of like, it's kind of like a combination of me teaching my puppets is one part of it, and that's kind of more like, I also have this website, Authentic Learner, and that's kind of supposed to be where the kids go, and then Authentic Teacher would be me eventually developing, like, professional development for teachers, and then the the weird thing is this summer, I got in this Facebook group of, or I've gotten in several of them, of parents whose students are struggling readers, struggling with dyslexia, and I just happen to have had a ton of training um, for struggling readers, for students who struggle with dyscalculia, which is like the math version. And so I've kind of created some webinars about, for parents, like, you know, well, the one main webinar is called My Student Has Dyslexia, What Do I Do Now? So it's either for teachers or for parents. And that's why I like I found your website because um, the webinar is based on this book by uh, Dr. Sally Shaywitz called Overcoming Dyslexia. And her book is all about focusing on the student's strengths. Mm-hmm. It's what I've used working. I mean, this principal handed me this book in 2005. And it's just like a fluke that he happened to hand that to me and I've had it, but it's just been like kind of like guiding Bible for helping kids 
who are struggling readers. I've tutored a lot of kids in the classroom, after school. I mean, I think I've taught over 700 kids total now in six different districts and 15 different schools just but this has always been where I start and she you know she talks about these are the cues to diagnosing dyslexia but you really want to focus on student strengths and so oh I love uh, that oh my gosh is that a good introduction (laughs) yeah no I I love that and um, I think it's great that so are you now kind of pivoting to be more of a trainer or like, are you still teaching in the, or part-time or do you now just do this other, um, this other educational stuff with the authentic teacher, authentic learner? Is that now your full-time gig? Well, that's a good question. I took this year off out of the classroom to kind of see where it's going to go. And then like I, I kind of mentioned when we were talking on my show, I also have the authentic, gar- I mean, ugh. My husband's like, you called it the Authentic Gardener. The Organic Gardener podcast is also. So, you know, I'm not really sure where it's all going to go. I Because you, you kind of clicked on it when you were talking about the kids learning to water ski. My favorite thing is to see the light bulbs pop over students' heads. And I just love to help kids learn. And when they've been struggling and struggling and struggling to get something and they finally get it, like I always think about you come back from Christmas and it almost seems like they've lost everything. But then all of a sudden at the end of January, the beginning of February, it's like you just see these light bulbs going off over all over your kids' heads in the classroom. Like they're finally getting the things that you've been working on for four months. And so that's where my passions lie you know, I don't know. I actually quit the classroom back in 2014 when I launched the Organic Gardener podcast. And then, I don't know, like six principals called me one summer and I ended up going back again. So I always tell the kids, you never know where I'm going to be. They were like, are you going to be fifth grade next year? What are you doing next year? And I was like, you know, I'm going to try to launch this authentic teacher. Will I, will it, I don't really know where I'm going. I don't know if that helps. So. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I What I would love for you to share, because most of my listeners are parents or work with kids in other settings, what are some, um, what's some advice you have for parents in terms of like, especially it sounds like you really specialize in helping them, like if their ha- kids has a deficit in some area or some kind of diagnosis, what would you say are like the first steps to do or what do you recommend parents do when they have a child who's um, struggling with something at school? Well, if I have a student who's struggling with reading, truth be told, I give them a copy of the Overcoming Dyslexia book because there's there's a lot of things to it. But, you know, the two biggest things is you have to remember you are your child's biggest advocate. Get in there, talk to their teacher, make sure you're working together, make sure if they do have dyslexia, I mean, get it diagnosed, find out, because if it's not dyslexia, you really want to know. The sooner you can get accommodations in place. A lot of times kids with dyslexia just need um, extra time, extra time to absorb things, extra time to take tests, reduce workload because it is taking them more time to do things. A lot of times kids who have dyslexia get tired faster. So, you know, don't pressure them to do things. Um, uh, the biggest thing with dyslexia is like learning to rhyme. A lot of people, you've never taught a kid how to read who doesn't know how to rhyme. You've never, and so, you know, even if they're older students, if they're still struggling, I really like focus on like singing, making sure they're looking at the lyrics, but singing along with the lyrics because that'll develop the rhyme. There's so many things on YouTube now. I mean, the whole hymnals on you on YouTube. I think you can sing along with any song in the hymnal or. Um, just go noodles got tons of things. There's tons of, you know, songs for older kids where they could just watch the lyrics while they're listening. And it's going to be a familiar thing. And then repeated reading, because the biggest thing you want to do is work on um, text fluency and helping kids, you know, gain that text fluency. Um, so music is a great one for me for repeated reading, I think, because all kids, you know, can relate to music. And then the other piece with music is, you know, in math, if they're struggling in math, you know, learning to count beats, learning measures, learning, you know, notes are broken up into fractions. Um, so working on things like that. And then it'll also bring that kinesthetic piece. And if they're, you know, playing, you know, tapping drums or making, you know, rhythm with that. And so, but definitely like um, she talks about their strengths in the book. A lot of times they'll be really interested. The other thing that I'm really passionate about is children's books there's so many picture books out there that are not written for kindergartners or preschoolers they're for third graders fourth graders fifth graders they have complex there's so many great children's books is kind of on the rise it's the one book in the publishing because my like truth be told my dream someday is to be a children's book illustrator and author and um i know because of that that children's books is actually one of the biggest growing um 
type of book that's being published today. And so if kids can re, if you have older kids, even high school kids, a lot of times, if they're interested in, you know, horses, you can find a picture book with tons of facts about horses. That's going to be enough and help them, you know, read those things, get magazines and things that they're interested in. If they're interested in water skiing or they're interested in mechanics or they're interested in dinosaurs or they're interested in, you know, whatever photography or whatever music, get them some magazines, get them books that they're interested in. Use your library. There's so many great resources. And then the other one, if you do have struggling kids listening, the library's got the app Overdrive where they can hear everything. Audiobooks, there's so many audiobooks. You know, that's why I would love for teachers to do more. And I'm, I'm connecting with my local community college about starting to teach a podcasting class because I think podcasting is a great way for kids to learn about topics they want, connect with other like-minded kids. And then if they start producing podcasts, you know, producing YouTube videos, I am, I don't know why I just live and breathe technology. It just, and, yeah. and so I'm very passionate about bringing, using technology in the classroom more than we are. Oh, I, I'm with you on that. It also makes it more meaningful when they feel like someone can, they're sharing it with someone, they're doing it for a reason. I think when yeah. we make things more meaningful, like at my uh, my son's high school, they have an online newspaper that's really well done. And it's like a job for the kids. They have assignments, there's photographers, there's editing, there's you know all this stuff. And to me, what's great about it is it's like job experience too, because they have deadlines, they're working with other people, they have edit, you know, it's like, it's a great whole thing. Plus, it is a giving a service to the community because they post about all the events that have happened or are coming. So it has meaning. I always think that, um, what's that book, The Freedom Writers? Oh, yeah, with Hilary Schwank, the movie. Yeah, I just, actually, yeah. I ordered that. It's like sitting at my library yeah. waiting for me to go pick it so, up because I'd never read the book. Right, and I think I don't, I haven't read the book either, but I do know the story. And basically, she got these kids to, I think it's a blog or something. They were sharing things. And so when you're sharing things out in the world, first of all, it feels more meaningful than just turning it into a teacher. And so I agree with you. I think using, you know, podcasts, videos, I've seen people do like video book reports, like make a little commercial for the book you read. How fun. The other kids like watching it. You have fun doing it. Um, I think those things are really, really good. And plus, a lot of people will end up using those in their jobs eventually. So might as well have them get good at doing more meaningful work with their screens. Like, you know, I, I tend to really promote a lot of like, let's get unplugged. But I like you, I love technology. I love podcasts. I love my blog and you know, I have fun reading other people's things. I love listening to other people's podcasts, YouTube, you know, so I like, I'm a consumer of all those things. Plus I like creating. And I think it's really great. So I think a lot of times our kids become purely consumers, like they're watching YouTube, they're playing games, but why not have, you know, a, teach them how to create the game and code the game teach them how to start their own channel and have a topic that they're interested in. And then they have to research it. So they might end up reading some blog posts or books or, you know, whatever. So I agree when you find things that kids that make them light up and get excited, that's when they're going to learn. Um, when you try to force people to learn something that they're not interested in, it's really hard. You're just not that motivated. I think a lot of times we forget that, you know, kids are just like adults. We, we like, they have interests, like let's, let, let's help them pursue those. So you can still get the end that you need. Like if we want them to learn to read or learn to write or learn to do math, make it somehow connect with something they're interested in. And they're much more likely to, to learn it. Like if you have kids have a business or something, and even if it's like fake money, have them like, you know, create something that they're selling to each other and have to count out change. I mean, how fun is that? You know, that there's so many ways that you can make learning more fun and kind of applicable to life. So I want to go back to, um, I think when I was talking to you for your podcast, you talked a little bit about more about what it being an authentic teacher means. Can you just explain that again? Cause I really liked how you talked about what being an authentic teacher means to you. Okay. Well, I can try. I mean, to me, it, it's kind of like exactly like you were saying. So that's why I love the Common Core Standards because we can take these lessons, we can take these skills that kids need to learn and teach them how to be, you know, critical thinkers, how to, you know, research, you know, what do we want? Do they, there's so much information on the internet. We don't need to be just memorizing basic facts. We don't need to be like just I, re I say this and you repeat it and regurgitate it back to me. It's applying the, you know, what you're learning, what you're reading um, into um, the context of the classroom, I guess. So like, 
what are some other examples of like math challenges I'm trying to think that I've posted? Well, kind of like what you were saying, like I went to the laundromat and like how many quarters do I have to put in the machine? You know, this is how many loads of laundry I have to do today. You know, how much is it going to cost me? Am I going to have enough money? You know, figuring out things like that. Um, and just uh, the blogging thing, like, and this is the other thing that like, I feel like I get a little frustrated with sometimes in school if you want a kid to blog, but they also have to read other blogs, we have to follow their, you know, what are they interested in? Like I, we were doing this thing for Dr. Seuss's, um, Dr. Seuss month. And we were doing like, Oh, the places we will go. And I was asking my students, well, where would you want to go? Well, second graders, what experiences do they have? They don't know. So they have to have time to research. Like one kid wanted to go to Disneyland and another kid was like researching, you know, his favorite sports team shoes on the internet. And, you know, somebody was kind of upset with me. A coach came in and she's like, why is this kid shopping on the internet? Or another kid was looking up space aliens. But to me, that made me see, oh, maybe he's interested in going out of space someday, you know, and then I can like, by giving him the chance to look at that, then I can go find the resources and find the sites that are good for them to go to. But if they don't ever have time to explore it and look around and see, how am I going to know what they're interested in? You know, maybe that kid's going to be a sports marketer someday. Or like my niece is going to St. John's just started because she wants to do, um, she, she wants to be a lawyer, but she wants to specialize and she's a big athlete. You know, she's a runner and a swimmer and, you know, she was always very big in sports and now she wants to go into sports law. Like you just, you never know where kids are going to, you know, what they're going to be interested in and just helping them find the things that, that, to me, authentic lessons in the classroom is what being an authentic teacher is. And then also following your passions. Like I always like to read a book about, you know, why did I move to Montana? I read that book when I was in fourth grade and ended up 50 miles, like really close to where the kid in the book was, you know, finding things that um, they, they are interested in helping them meet those challenges in their lives or meet the, you know, reach their goals, be who they want to be. Mm, that's beautiful. Okay, so Jackie, tell me, um, tell listeners where they can find your blog, your or if you have a blog or your podcast. Just why don't you kind of give us the rundown, and then I'll also put links in the show notes. So where can we find yep. you if we want to learn more? Well, it's all just at authenticteacher.com. dot um, The podcast really is basically just um, the blog. Like I, I have like the audio blog where like on Mondays I'll kind of just talk about. My experiences on Thursdays, I try to do an interview. And then on Fridays, I have this thing called Facebook Fridays where I'll like post a tip on starting a Facebook group um, for your classroom. And just it's all at AuthenticTeacher.com. Okay, great. Well, I can't wait to check it all out and see more of what you have going on. Okay, so I just have one final question. This is something new that I'm going to be doing with my guests. Sure. I, didn't, I didn't tell you in advance, but hopefully you can come up with something. If you had one thing that you wanted to tell parents of something that you think could be helpful in helping them raise a kid who becomes a thriving adult, what would that one thing be? Ooh, that's a great question. Um... One thing that I would tell parents, I guess just, um, I'm going to go with what you said about reading every night. I mean, really, if you don't feel comfortable reading, download an audio book, share something together. I mean, when I was in college, we had one class that met for, I think, um, three hours once a week. And my teacher spent 90 minutes of that time reading to us because sharing a book whether it's Charlotte's Web, which is still a classic we read in fourth grade this year. I loved it. You know, sharing a book together, there's nothing more important. And so even if you're not a reader, try to find a book that you can read with your students, whether you listen. The, another great resource is that um, story online stories or whatever, where the Screen Actors Guild read the books. Get a copy of that book and let your child listen along. Just reading is key. Oh, I love that. That's right up my alley. Okay, we'll end there. Jackie, thank you so much for being on the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for having me. It was just a delight. I love podcasting. It was so fun to talk with you today, Audrey. Okay, we'll do it again sometime. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. I'm glad you could join me. If you would like to read notes and get all the links to things that Jackie and I talked about, please visit my website at sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 58. You'll find all the notes and links there, 
as well as a link to the episode that I visited Jackie for on her podcast, The Authentic Teacher Podcast. While you're on my website, if you don't already subscribe to get my emails, I would love to have you join my community and keep up to date on my podcast episodes and blog posts. Again, you can find that link to sign up for emails at sunshine-parenting.com. Finally, I would really appreciate it if you enjoy the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, if you would take a moment to give me a rating and review on iTunes. It's a great way to share with other people new podcasts that they might be interested in listening to. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that. To end this episode, I'd like to leave you with the words from an article that Jackie linked to from her website. The article is from thedailymail.com. And it is titled, Authentic Teachers Who Laugh and Joke with Their Pupils Really Do Encourage Better Behavior. Here's what it says. Teachers who love their subject take time to talk to pupils and make jokes get better results, according to new research. Sharing experiences and even admitting mistakes also improves results. Known as having an authentic style, Young people prefer this to a more modern, inauthentic approach where teachers treat their job as just a job. They have little or no emotional investment in their young charges, according to research. The study of 300 college students found the former type achieved higher levels of learning and deeper understanding. They showed a willingness to share details of their life and displayed elements of their humanity by telling personal stories, making jokes, and admitting mistakes. They also demonstrated care and compassion by recognizing students as individuals and attending to their needs, both academically and personally. This podcast is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high-quality shows for families just like yours. Download our free network app on Apple and Android and listen to your favorite episodes on the go.